21 years ago on a day much like today, I got off a train with my wife and uh, we had a, a couple of backpacks full of clothing and uh, we made our way to the end of a platform, we crossed the train line, we walked up a street into the main street of a, a small town, uh, there was a main square, very old historic buildings, uh, we walked down the main street and uh, we finally stood before the thing that we'd come to see or the thing that I had particularly wanted to see. I think at that stage we'd been through about five countries. I stood before a door, came to see a door, a little bit more than a door, but certainly a door, uh, embossed into this iron door with 95 statements. Of course, it's the, um, the uh, castle church in Wittenberg. We wanted to have a look at Wittenberg itself and the, the church and, and other bits and pieces but I uh, wanted to see in particular uh, this famous door, which of course looms so large in our thinking, doesn't it? It's the 500th anniversary uh, when Luther uh, nailed his uh, 95 points of complaint, if you like, against uh, the Roman Catholic Church. I don't know if anybody's read through the 95 points, the 95 thesis. Some of them are not easy to understand. Um, I'm not quite sure what Luther means. Some of them seem quite contradictory, in fact. Uh, they obviously meant something to the theologians with whom he wanted to debate. Of course, the main issue at hand was how can a person be made right with God, which is what we were talking about earlier on in the day. And Luther, as we know, drew particular attention to the sale of indulgences, the abuse of indulgences, an indulgence was a certificate of merit that could be purchased. Basically, the Pope had the power to dispense forgiveness from a treasury that consisted of merits purchased by Christ and the Virgin Mary and uh, all of the saints. And thus, it was a way of expiating a person's guilt by an indulgence. And depending upon the quality of the indulgence, you could secure for yourself or your family members less time in purgatory. The more you spent, the better the indulgence. And I'm not certain of this, but I think it was Tetzel, the great salesman we've already heard of. He sold one particular expensive indulgence, stating that even if you had raped the Blessed Virgin, uh, you could have reduced uh, your time in purgatory. And of course, Luther is revolting against the idea that salvation can be purchased. It's a, a cheapening of grace. It's turning grace into a commodity that can be bought. The underlying issue with Luther's thesis, it goes beyond simply that of salvation. The underlying issue really with Luther's thesis is that of authority. Who or what has the right to direct the affairs of men when it comes to religion? Luther is going to argue from Scripture. And in doing so, he was in a sense presenting a rival, a rival authority to that of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. Let us just be reminded that uh, Luther was born into a church um, whereby tradition subjugated the authority of Scripture. In other words, the hierarchy of the church, that being the Pope and the magisterium or the church council, was higher than that of Scripture. We know, don't we, that um, the Pope is regarded as the Vicar of Christ was said that uh, Peter was the first pope and then by way of apostolic succession all other popes spoke on behalf of God. So when we think of church tradition with regards to the Roman Catholic Church we're really talking about an oral authority that belonged to the pope and the church councils. Roman Catholic teaching is that it was the church, the hierarchy of the church, which in fact sanctions scripture. So it's a higher authority than scripture. 
and the hierarchy of the church alone could interpret Scripture correctly and apply it. Well, Luther's going to argue against this. Luther's going to say, Popes and councils have erred in the past, but Scripture never errs. Papal infallibility wasn't made uh, a part of Roman Catholic dogma until 1870, but it was already in place. It was already there. That's what was believed. It was a debate amongst uh, Catholic scholars as to whether the Pope or the Magisterium held outright authority. We don't have time to look at that uh, this evening, but either way, uh, church tradition, the authority of the church, was greater than that of Scripture. Well, Luther is going to challenge that. I'm sure when it comes to matters of authority in faith, that we are convinced of sola scriptura. I'm sure we are all convinced of it, but I want to give some thought to this subject this evening in the light of tradition. Luther is revolting against the tradition of the church, this idea of papal infallibility. So I want to give some thought to the subject of sola scriptura in the light of church tradition. I want to look at it from two angles. The first thing I want us to consider is tradition rightly understood and applied. Tradition rightly understood and applied. You mentioned tradition in Christian circles, particularly reform circles, and it's like a red rag to a bull. The word tradition comes from the Latin trado, and it simply means to pass something on, something to be passed down the line. Of course, there are many traditions we know culturally that are passed from one generation to the next generation and so on, whether they are traditions relating to marriage or some other kind of festivity. Uh, the word itself ought not to scare us in this is a sense in which it can be used in a good way. The question really for us is this. If we claim to be God's people, if we claim to be people of faith, in what tradition do we stand? The question is not, do we have a tradition, but in what tradition do we stand? All people of faith stand in some kind of tradition. They have a body of teaching that has been passed on down to them to the present. And it's a mistake for us to suppose that the reformers were anti-tradition. That is simply not the case. The fact is they drew heavily upon tradition, just not the way that the Roman Catholic Church did. Catholicism used an oral authority over Scripture. The Reformers used tradition to uphold the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture. They appealed to tradition to support their work of Reformation. Let me read a quote to you from a Reformation scholar called David Steinmetz of Duke Divinity School. He says this, The Reformation is an argument not just about the Bible, but about the early church fathers whom the Protestants wanted to claim. This is one of those things that is so obvious nobody has paid much attention to it. Then you look at it and you see it everywhere. The reformers use the fathers all over the place. We know that Calvin read Augustine. We have discovered that Luther read Jerome. He had copies annotated in his own hand. The index of Calvin's institutes is filled with an enormous number of quotations from the fathers. And in the first preface to that work addressed to Francis I, Calvin did his best to show that his teachings were in complete harmony with the fathers. The Protestants did this because they were keen to have ancestors. They knew that innovation was another word for heresy. Ours is the ancient tradition, they said. The innovations were introduced in the Middle Ages. In other words, by the Catholics. They issued anthologies of the fathers to show that the fathers had taught 
what the reformers were teaching. Tradition rightly understood and applied is a companion to sola scripture and not an enemy of it. And I think that this is of particular importance for us today. We live in a rabidly individualistic society. A society that is contemptuous of the past. A, si a society that distrusts what has been tried and tested and passed on. And this kind of thinking pervades the church. Pervades the church. And I think it's dangerous to detach yourself from tried, uh, from what has been tried and tested and accepted sound orthodoxy. I believe we ignore at great peril those who have gone before and what they have to say to us in the present. I want to present a few reasons under this first heading, looking at tradition rightly understood and applied, why I believe tradition is so important and so vital for us today. Firstly, tradition provides us with a body of doctrine. None of us approach the truth from a neutral standpoint. We read the Bible through the lens of interpretation. So you can give a passage of scripture to a Jehovah's Witness, to a Roman Catholic, to a Mormon, to a Seventh-day Adventist. You can give a, a, a passage of scripture to, an, to a Muslim because even they use scripture. You can give a passage of the same passage of scripture to a reformed person. And each of those people will draw different conclusions. And the reason for that is because they have been schooled in different traditions. No one comes to the word of God from a neutral standpoint. We all come having been taught to understand and think a certain way. How many of us here are Trinitarian? Okay, there's about six converts. You have a lot of work to do. You men from... Well, it was Richard Baxter who said, I've been teaching all these years and they still don't know that Christ be God, so you're in good shoes perhaps. We're all Trinitarian, aren't we? Uh, how many of us are Trinitarian, have, have a, a right... Uh, Trinitarian framework simply by reading scripture on our own. The reality is you've been taught to understand the Trinity and somebody has, has taught your pastor and somebody has taught the author of the books that you've read and the framework that you have with regards to the Trinity takes you back to the councils of Nicaea and Chalcedon. We are monotheistic, aren't we? We don't believe in several gods. There is only one true and living God, and that one true and living God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You didn't come to that yourself. You didn't sit on the end of your bed with your Bible and, and draw that conclusion on your own. You've been taught that. You stand in a, in a Trinitarian tradition, and the great language of Nicaea and Chalcedon explains it so well. I see it dealing with Christ in relation to the Father and the Holy Spirit and then Chalcedon dealing with Christ in relation to himself. Let's try again. How many hold to covenant theology? Okay, there's ten reformed people. What is covenant theology? There's a sense in which we can say it's a hermeneutic tool by which we understand how the Bible fits together in terms of God dealing with men. Do you come to a covenantal theological position on your own? No, you've been taught it. Stands in contrast, doesn't it, to another great, but we believe erroneous tradition, that of dispensationalism. And the list could go on and on with a whole range of things. Ecclesiology, an understanding of original sin, eschatology. How did we come to any of the positions that we presently hold? Not simply by pouring yourself over the word of God, though no doubt 
uh, that's been there as well. But traditions of interpretation have been passed down. By God's grace, faithful men have gone before us. Their teaching has been tried and tested by others. A tradition has been established which takes us back to Scripture and helps us to understand Scripture. But we have not been left to work it all out for ourselves. Secondly, tradition provides a safety net. It enables us to see that our understanding is in keeping with the patterns of sound orthodoxy. When you read the Bible, and I trust we do, and you draw conclusions from the Bible, which I trust we do, how do you know you've got it right? How do you know that your conclusions are in fact correct? When you interact with the theology of the day and the ideologies of the day and the teaching of others, how do you know whether it's right or wrong? And surely in seeking to understand correctly the Bible, we need to interact with those who have gone before. Even if we discuss matters with, with our pastors and we read current books on a particular subject, inevitably they also will take us to the past. This is what the theologians of the 18th century thought. This is what the Puritans taught. This is what the Reformers taught. This is patristic theology taking us back to the Apostolic Fathers. See, the past acts as a sounding board. What have they thought in the past? What has been the established understanding of a particular concept or a doctrine or a passage. 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 to 21. Knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What Peter is effectively saying here is that it's not men who have given to us Scripture. Scripture did not originate in the hearts of men. Scripture originated with God, and it's God who determines the meaning of Scripture. It's not for us to decide what Scripture means. It's God who's decided. It's up to us to discover what God is saying to us. And in part, how do we do that? Well, there is wisdom in many counsellors, isn't there? We consider what others have said with regards to Scripture, what they believed God to be telling us. It's a great tragedy in the modern church, I think, when you hear of Bible studies, which are not Bible studies really, but the, the idea is that everybody sits around and, you know, John, what do you think? And Peter, what's your view? And Mary, what do you think of this? And I don't mean to be rude, but who cares? The question is not what do we think, but what does God intend us to understand? Because it's God who gives meaning to these words. It's ours to discover what they are. We don't do that on our own. The past provides a sounding board for us. What do the reformers think? What do the eminent ministers think? The, 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 the giants of the past, what did they say? And thirdly, tradition provides credibility. I couldn't think of a better way of putting it. Tradition provides credibility. In other words, we're not propagating new and novel ideas. When we stand with those who have gone before, others can see. We're not kind of reinventing the wheel. We're not propagating something new and trendy. Charles Hodge, you probably know that name, the, the well-known Presbyterians, the Hodges. Charles Hodge celebrating 50 years of ministry. I'm sure this is meant tongue-in-cheek, at least I take it this way. He, he said on this uh, time of celebration, he said, we're proud to say that, uh, that uh, no new idea has ever come out of this 
seminary. Uh, a new idea never originated in this seminary. Uh, he probably means it in one sense tongue-in-cheek, we're proud to say this, but effectively what he meant was we have been faithful. We have, we, we, we have not attempted to do something new and novel. We have stood in the shoes of those who have gone before. We have the credibility. We have been faithful. I started my Christian life in a Pentecostal church when I was 20. I'd never been to church in my life. When I was converted, I'd never been to church. I was converted in someone's lounge room. And he took me to a Pentecostal church. I didn't know one church from the next. But I began to read scripture and try to understand scripture. I found scripture a difficult book at times to understand in certain areas. I was there all up for, for around seven years and it would have been maybe four to five years that I'd been there. I began to struggle with Pentecostal theology. I really became very unsure about speaking in tongues and uh, people with healing gifts, this kind of thing. One issue in particular troubled me greatly. They would teach uh, the idea of being born again a certain way and it didn't seem to match what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. I became, over a period of time, increasingly anxious about the things that I was being taught and, 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 and I was wrestling with those things and struggling to make sense of Scripture. I found no comfort in Scripture, to be honest, it just made me anxious as to whether or not I was on the right or wrong path. And in the end, things began to come together for me, not purely by reading the Bible, though I was certainly doing that. I started to read history, started to go to Christian bookshops, began to develop an interest in history, which we were never taught. There was no reference whatsoever at all to men and women of the past. So I started to read biography of John Newton. I read biography of Martin Luther, Kittleson's biography. I don't know if you, you know James Kittleson. And one of the things I discovered, at least as much as I was able to tell, Pentecostalism really had no historical credibility. Apart from sort of isolated pockets of odd people and sort of, strange kind of people at various times in history. There didn't seem to be any historical credibility to this movement. It seemed to me to be a modern phenomenon that had been around for less than a hundred years. That alarmed me. Furthermore, I started to read theologically. I started to get my hands on good books. Again, material that I'd never been taught. I'd never heard sermons on uh, straight through the Sermon on the Mount or theological sermons or the Ten Commandments or the great doctrines of Scripture. We never heard any of that stuff, so I started to read theological material. And again, I could see, based upon the teaching that had gone before, that the Pentecostal slash charismatic movement really had no current credibility, had no roots to the past. This also touches on what I just said previously, tradition used rightly provides a safety net. The alarm bells were ringing. Alarm bells started to ring. Well, thankfully, by the grace of God, the missing pieces of the jigsaw began to take shape. And for better or for worse, I ended up deciding that I was a Reformed Baptist. And uh, my life has taken the course that it has. Let me just touch on another issue with regards to this, and it's... I'm taking a, a different line, I suppose, but I think it's worth saying. I think this has something to say to us with regards to songs that we sing in church. Currently here, a lot of talk of the, the worship wars. And a lot of churches are abandoning the older hymns. I think we need to understand that when we sing in church, we're not just singing nice songs about God. We're singing truth. One of the reasons I think it's so important that we don't throw away the older hymns, 
Apart from the fact that they glorify God and they are edifying, both those things are true, they provide us with a connection to the past. Now, I'm not opposed to singing newer hymns, and I think you've got a great balance. I really like some of those newer hymns, and I think we should sing them. But don't cast out the old ones. The old ones connect us to those who have gone before. We stand in the same shoes, with the same doctrines as those eminent hymn writers and theologians of the past. And I think, personally, it's just my opinion, that the church is greatly impoverished, greatly impoverished by discarding the old hymns and simply singing the newer ones. To sum these points up, when we look back to the Reformation and the emphasis on sola scriptura, and it is a vital doctrine, it is so important, yet we need to be clear about what it means. The Reformers were championing the authority and sufficiency of Scripture against the backdrop of Roman Catholic abuse. They were not saying that tradition has no part to play in our understanding and practice of Scripture. In fact, I think we can argue that the Bible itself teaches the concept and usefulness of tradition. Previous message... uh, Earlier on today, I think, uh, at the, the, the beginning of the morning, touched on this. 1 Timothy chapter 2, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. This was read to us earlier, the first sermon this morning. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. I don't want to go over the same territory that we looked at, but just to make a couple of comments. The idea of a pattern, hold fast the pattern of sound words, is that of a framework, a definite structure. Sound words meaning dependable, healthy words is one way of putting it. What Paul is saying to Timothy is that the scripture establishes a theological framework, a framework of words with meaning that can be articulated and explained. He goes on to say that that framework, that theological framework, is to be given to faithful men and to be passed on to faithful men, and to be passed on to faithful men. What does tradition mean? The root word in Latin, to pass on, to pass on, and to pass on. You know, on one level, practically speaking, this means that a necessary Christian vernacular has been created and one with which we need to be familiar and use the doctrines of grace. What are the doctrines of grace? It's the order of salvation. It's what God does in order to save us. Truly, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. A Christian vernacular. I can't turn somewhere in my Bible to the page that shows me Truly. And, and, and spells it out. The five solas. There's no page that contains the five souls, yet we believe that they are true, right, and good, and necessary. We've mentioned the Trinity. The word's not used, as we know. Yet we hold steadfastly to those creeds that came out of Nicaea and Chalcedon. As far as I'm concerned, if you're not Nicaean in your thinking... You're not sound in your thinking. You're probably not converted. If Jesus Christ be not the Son of God, he be not the Saviour. There are many terms. Penal substitution, the mystical union. It goes on and on. 
None of these terms are scriptural in themselves, yet they express what the Bible teaches. And in using them, we maintain a necessary tradition, a tried and tested pattern of sound words. And I would say with regards to really most of those issues, at best, if anybody rejected them, they would be unsound. More than likely, they would be unconverted. Friends, the test of orthodoxy is not just do you believe the Bible. It's not even do you believe sola scriptura. The test of orthodoxy is not do you believe the Bible. The test of orthodoxy is this. What do you believe the Bible says? What do you believe the Bible teaches? The cults claim to believe the Bible. Every man and his dog claims to believe the Bible. The issue is this. What does the Bible teach? In other words, in what tradition do you stand? What has been passed down to you? How do you interpret Scripture? That's the issue. We all stand in a tradition. It is either sound or unsound. Let me change tact. Second point, probably not as long as this point, although that's a dangerous thing to say. Who knows? <laughs> Second thing I want to consider is the danger of tradition. The danger of tradition. Human nature being what it is, the pendulum very easily swings too far the other way. There are those who neglect tradition, have no interest in the teaching and history of the past. There are those at the opposite end of the spectrum and we ought not to think, we make a grave mistake if we suppose that the danger posed by tradition is unique to Roman Catholicism or other heretical groups. I'm of the mind that believers who love Reformed theology, love Reformed history, and I'm one of them, are particularly susceptible to this. Let me present to you some reasons why, or rather how, the danger of tradition manifests itself. Again, three points, fairly brief. There can be an infatuation with individuals and movements. This is this came out in the morning devotion at the prayer meeting and, and some of the prayers. I didn't know what anybody was going to say or pray, obviously. Um, but uh, hopefully our messages all tie in and correspond. But I think there can be very much an infatuation with individuals and movements. I don't know how many times I have heard people say to me something like, if only we lived in the days of the Puritans. If only we lived in the days of Spurgeon. About five or so years ago, I preached in a congregational church, maybe two or three, four times, something like that. And uh, I was asked to go there. And um, on one particular occasion, I got there early. and There was, just, there was one lady there who'd opened up, an older lady. And um, so I've introduced myself um, and she began, we began chatting. She said to me, oh, where are the Spurgeons? Where are the Spurgeons? She said, no one's faithful anymore. No one's preaching the gospel. And she went on and on and on. And at the end of it all, I almost felt like, oh, well, what's the point? We may as well go home. So at the end of the day, I don't run orphanages. I don't write books. Um, I don't have anything like the output of that man, and I don't have to. Uh, it is foolishness to think that there are not faithful men and faithful churches, and God is not building his church. 
That's one thing also with regards to the Reformation. We need to understand that when it occurred and we've spoken about darkness and light, and yes, it was a putrid time in many ways. Uh, it was dark. The church was corrupt. But again, we make a grave mistake if we think people were not being saved. I suspect, and I can't back this up with a lot, there were probably more Christians than what we imagine. Not necessarily in a healthy state. God is always in the business of saving people. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 10. Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. I think the good old days, quite frankly, is a myth. And the reality is this, we don't know what it was like to live in Spurgeon's days or the Puritan days. Do you fancy, by the way, living at a time when there wasn't running water and toilets and anaesthetic? My parents took me to the UK several times when I was a boy. We had no relatives in Australia or my family are English. I got spoiled and taken to football matches and I had cousins and aunts and uncles and I used to complain. I only went there twice, I didn't go there all the time, but I used to complain. Why, why did you come here? The families in England, it's so much better. All that football, all those things to do. My father used to say to me, you don't know what it's like to live there. You're judging things on the basis of a holiday. You haven't lived through an English winter when the pipes are frozen. You, you haven't lived in an English winter when it's dark at 8 o'clock at the morning and dark at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And when they left the UK, it was falling terribly into social decline. They said, you don't know what it was like then. You don't know what the Puritan days were like. And you can read all the history that you, that you want to. And you can read about Spurgeon and Luther and all these people. You don't know what it was like. And it's a foolish thing for you to be saying, oh, if only we lived in those days. You mean when they were burning Christians at the stake? You had no access to the scriptures? You don't know what it was like. The good old days are a myth. God is always at work, people, always at work. Sometimes more evidently in certain places and at certain times, but God doesn't slumber. God is working now. He's building his church. Don't judge Christendom by what you see in Sydney and Brisbane because God could very well, and I suspect he's doing a great deal more overseas than what we know. And you know, it's a foolish thing to think like this because people who do are very rarely ever useful in the present because they're, they're locked into the past. When this is the case, the Christian faith becomes less and less about Christ and more about this person and that person and that movement of the revivalists and him and her. The reformers point us to Christ. We are to be enamoured with the God-man. It's him we worship. It's him we adore. It's him we obey. I think as a younger man, I probably fit into this category, to be quite honest. I was infatuated with Puritans and reformers. I took my wife to, to see the doors at Wittenberg. In fact, I dragged my wife all over Western Europe. And the UK, you know, so I could see pulpits. So I could see Calvin's chair. I've touched Calvin's chair in his pulpit. And I've been under the tree where Latimer shared the Lord's Supper. And I've been to where Knox is buried in the car park and all of the physical places that Bunyan used to base Pilgrim's Progress on. I've been to them all. I was like those people going to see Peter's knuckles and, and Jesus' beard and the... I know what it's like. They are fascinating. Once I began to read this stuff, that's all I was reading. Secondly, there can be a blind acceptance of ideas. Okay, the danger of the, the, uh, the danger with tradition, there can be a blind acceptance of ideas. Well, a number of years ago, I listened to a sermon with a bunch of ministers. And, and again, I was the young fellow. They were all older than me. And uh, the guy preaching said some very questionable things in his sermon. And um, one of the older men that I was with 
challenged him about what he'd said. I was kind of in the background, uh, reasonably young, and uh, I, I certainly didn't agree with what he was saying. But anyway, this older man, the, the sort of senior statesman of the group, challenged the preacher afterwards. And this preacher's defence was this. But that's what so-and-so says. That's what the justification was for the material that he'd included in his sermon. That's what so-and-so says. It was very clear that he had not wrestled with Scripture. And if, I'm all for consulting commentaries, by the way. We should consult commentaries. That's good use of tradition. But we need to wrestle with scriptures, uh, the Scripture ourselves, comparing Scripture with Scripture, looking at the meaning of words, using uh, the commentaries and so on, but drawing our own conclusions because we believe that's what the Bible says. This guy was simply, that's what I've heard so-and-so say, and uh, he is an eminent man who stands in the Reformed tradition, so I'll simply just take his ideas and make them mine. We need to be careful in our Reformed tradition that we don't just lean upon the ideas of others, unquestioning them, not questioning them rather, because they are perceived to stand in the Reformed tradition. They are eminent, they are respected, and so we take them at face value. Surely being Reformed means being Berean. Searching the scriptures for ourselves as well as consulting those other sources. Acts chapter 17 verse 11. These were more, uh, these were more fair minded than those of Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness excuse me, and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Uh, the, the Bereans were not a suspicious bunch. What we're being told here is that they weren't gullible. With all readiness they received what was being taught, but then they consulted the word of God. That's what we're to do. You know, fathers are responsible to teach their children. I, I trust and hope that many of us, or all of us in fact, would have family devotions. It's not the church's responsibility to, to teach little children, it's a father's responsibility. It's not the Sunday school teacher who brought your children into the world, it's the parents. I teach my children. I'm always saying to them, question, question things. Receive what I say, learn from me. But you, as you grow up, need to wrestle with these ideas for yourself. Faith needs to be personalised. You can't just ride on the coattails of your father because this is what I believe. You need to wrestle, ask questions. I love it when they ask me questions. They meet people and different ideas and they interact and I love the questions. They're beginning to think. Don't just accept things because so-and-so. That's what Calvin says. Well, Calvin may in fact be wrong. He was wrong about assurance. I'd add to this by saying we need to read broadly. Jeremy Walker, who I think many of us know, he had an article out a year or two ago and uh, he, he was challenging Christians to read broadly. I imagine most of us are Reformed Baptists. Read outside the circle. Read outside the square. What do others have to say? How do you know we're right? Read broadly. It's interesting, the fellow that I mentioned, the preacher, he had no trouble criticising Catholics. In fact, this man has no trouble criticising everyone. Why is he any different to a Roman Catholic? That's what so-and-so says. His ignorance is no different to theirs. Thirdly and lastly, the danger of tradition, there can be a desire to keep up appearances. Some people lose sight of what is actually scriptural and important to God because they are more concerned with maintaining their perception of what it means to be reformed and to stand in the reformed tradition. What were the Pharisees concerned with? 
They were concerned with their own traditions. They had the appearance of godliness and and discipline and, and all that's good, yet without any substance. There's a minister in Sydney, he's an old man now, but still a very, very capable man. He's a preacher, he's a Presbyterian guy, he's a a solid, faithful preacher. In my estimation, not that I've been exposed to, to that much preaching, but he's one of the best preachers that I've heard. I really enjoy his company, I enjoy his preaching. He is conservative, he is reformed, he is not interested uh, in, in any of the trendy gimmicks. He says to me, there are churches that have a propensity, and a pro- uh, that, that are prone to looseness. He said, we have to be honest that in reform circles, we have a propensity towards legalism. That's just the way that it works. Because we have a serious approach to scripture and legalism and the traditions of the past actually appeal to us because they appear serious and studious and disciplined. In fact, he said to me, we are sticking our heads in the sand if we don't acknowledge that this has been a very real problem. Friends, should ministers, Christians, other churches seek to push us down a particular path or fashion us in a certain way, we must always ask this question, upon what basis? Because it's what you think we should do? Or is it the will of Christ? Because you think that that's what it means to be reformed? Or is it the will of God? Let us remember Luther's famous response to Johannek at the Diet of Worms. Unless I am convinced by scripture and sound reason, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience would be neither right nor safe. God help me, here I stand, I can do no other. Luther is saying that Christ is Lord of the conscience, not men. Christ is Lord of the conscience. It's Christ who determines how we live and what is good and bad and right and wrong, not men. We are to fear God, not men. The priority for us as Christians is not to appear to be reformed because it makes us look good in the eyes of certain people. The priority is Christ-likeness. What is the will of Jesus Christ? That's the priority. Furthermore, we need to remember the teaching of our own confession. And I think that this is largely forgot. What is chapter 21? In the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, of Christian liberty and liberty of conscience. There are a whole range of things you are free to do, and I am free to do, and you are free not to do, and I am free not to do, and our churches are free to do and not to do, and you know what? It is no one's business. It is no one's business. We had a a couple in our church for a number of years, great couple, sort of people you're sad to lose. They are from Europe. I won't mention exactly where they were from, but um, they moved back to Europe. They were with us for two to three years, something like that. Very encouraging couple, particularly the guy, very hungry uh, to to know God's word. And um, they're, they're back in their homeland. It's culturally and traditionally a Roman Catholic country although now it's obviously very secular. And uh, they finally, in the city, found a Reformed Baptist work. It's only a very, very small work. Um, They were living well outside the city. They were travelling quite a way to get in. They're living closer now. And um, the fellow 
rings me up from time to time. I ring him, and he's really quite dismayed at uh, the situation that he's in. So there's really no churches to go to. This church is confessional. Said the the preacher. He said he has his hobby horses, two, three, maybe four things that inevitably he gets onto. He rants and he rants and he rants because he thinks that this is what it means to be reformed. They go out on the weekends and they hand out tracts try to get people to come. I think the church is made up of about 15 people. Finally, a woman comes. She's an older woman, she's a big woman. She's rough around the edges. She's very unkept. They're giving her literature. She's reading. She's asking questions. My friend and his wife are thrilled. He said to me, inevitably, he said, inevitably, the pastor gets on to his hobby horses, uh, one, one of which... She really doesn't fit in because she's quite unkept, quite rough around the edges. She's not prim and proper in her dress and mannerisms. And so he rants about how bad the world is and how bad effectively people like her are. And my friend said to me, she knew who he was speaking about. We all knew who he was speaking about. And as soon as it finished, she got up and she walked out and she's never been back. And he said this to me. He said, our hearts are broken. We have been trying to reach out. Is that what it means to be reformed? Where's the grace of Christ in that? The one who sat with the prostitutes and the destitutes and the lame and the unlovely. Is that the spirit of Christ? Is that what it means to be reformed? Because someone doesn't fit in to their neat, managed little uh, 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 box. I find that disgusting if it's as it has been explained. I didn't sign up for that. That's not what it means to be reformed. That's not what it means to be Christ-like. We believe in the grace of God, don't we, as reformed people? Let's extend it to others. I'm not talking about wishy-washy Christianity. I'm not talking about accepting things in our church which are unacceptable. But I am talking about emulating the love, the compassion, and the mercy that has come to us and extending it to others. Let me conclude with a couple of words of application what does the Reformation teach us about authority and the relationship between Scripture and tradition? Negatively, we need to be careful that we don't place an inordinate significance upon tradition which subdues the place of Scripture. That's where tradition becomes wrong, when it overrules and subjugates the sufficiency and authority of Scripture. And this is the underlying current of the 95 Thesis. And let us be aware that reformed people can be guilty of creating their own popes. They can be guilty of non-scriptural priorities. They can be guilty of an unhealthy sentimentality. And so while they would unequivocally reject Roman Catholicism, they can in fact be guilty of the same error just dressed in different garb. Positively in the right sense, the Reformation commends tradition to us. It teaches us to be students of those who have gone before, to learn from them, to use them as a sound, uh, sounding board. The Reformation teaches us to think critically, engaging with the giants of the past. As C.S. Lewis said, we should not be guilty of chronological snobbery, turning our back on the past as though it has nothing to teach us. And friends, that's why we're here this weekend, isn't it? Because the Reformation does have something to say to us, excuse me, in the present. We need to know what that tradition involves because we are part of it. We need to stand firm upon it in a day when much 
that is good and right and true and long established is crumbling and being rejected. May the Lord bless his word and these few thoughts to our hearts this evening. May he help us all. Amen.